Al Hussein, the saga of love, sacrifice and freedom. The Sacrifice in Mesopotamia The land between rivers Tigris and Euphrates, known in the ancient times as Mesopotamia, is considered to be the cradle of human civilization. This area is credited for developing agriculture, writing, mathematics, astronomy and simple machines like the wheel. Today this area is part of modern-day Iraq. It is in this land that a supreme sacrifice and courageous stand was taken, which has changed the course of human history. This land is the altar of lovers, and it has the fragrance of the blood of martyrs. It has been a visiting place for the prophets and messengers of God, and is frequented by heavenly angels. It is one of the doorways to the heaven. This land is known as Karbala, and it is the final resting place of the chief of martyrs, Al Hussein. Karbala is a city in central Iraq, about 100 kilometers south of the capital Baghdad. This city contains the shrines of Al Hussein, his half brother Al Abbas, and their 72 family members and companions. Karbala is visited each year by millions of pilgrims from all across the world. The pilgrims are mostly Shia Muslims, but many people of other faiths also visit. The peak of this visitation is during an occasion known as Arba'in, or the 40th, when an estimated 20 million people visit Karbala, many travelling on foot for days from the nearby cities of Najaf and Basra. But who is Al Hussein, and why is he so beloved that millions choose to visit him every year? What were the reasons behind his stand and his sacrifice? And what is his similarity with the story of John the Baptist mentioned in the Gospel. But most importantly, what is the relevance of his stand to our personal lives and to the present era? To understand this, let's go back in time, some 4,000 years. Al Hussein Our story begins in a place called Ur, which is also located in the present-day southern Iraq. Prophet Abraham, the patriarch of Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, lived in this area roughly 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. He had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. From the lineage of Isaac came prophets like Jacob, Joseph, Moses and Jesus, peace be upon all of them. From the lineage of Ishmael came the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Prophet Muhammad had only one daughter called Fatima, who was married to Muhammad's cousin Ali. Fatima and Ali had four children, two boys, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, and two daughters, Zainab and Umm Kulsum. Muhammad loved Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein dearly. He said that Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein are the chiefs of the youth of paradise. He used to show affection towards his grandsons publicly. He used to say, Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Al Hussein is also commonly known as Imam Al Hussein, having the spiritual rank of an Imam. After Prophet Muhammad, there are 12 Imams, nine of them coming from the lineage of Al Hussein. The last of them is called Al Mahdi, who is prophesied to fill the earth with justice, equity, and peace towards the end of time, along with Jesus Christ, just as it would have been filled with injustice and oppression. Genesis 17:20 talks about the 12 princes from the lineage of Ishmael. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. Al Hussein had a charismatic personality. He was very generous, humble, kind and forgiving, but at the same time extremely courageous. He looked after the poor and destitute in his community. He was full of knowledge and wisdom poured from his tongue. Anyone who came across him fell in awe of him and immediately developed affection for him. He had a majestic aura which left a deep impression on those who interacted with him. 
Al Hussein was completely consumed by the love and servitude of God and had annihilated himself in the divine being. In one of his prayers, he invoked God by saying, What did he find, the one who lost you? And what did he lose, the one who found you? There is a lot of similarity between Imam Hussein and John the Baptist, also known as Yahya. John the Baptist was the son to Prophet Zechariah. The Bible mentions John the Baptist in Matthew 3 as follows. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Quran also mentions the birth of John the Baptist by saying, O Zechariah, we give you good news of a boy whose name shall be Yahya, John, and we have not made his namesake before. Quran 19.7 Quran further says about him, Peace be upon him on the day he was born, and the day he shall die, and the day he shall be raised to life. Quran 19.15 John the Baptist publicly objected to the ruler of his time, Herod Antipas of Galilee, for divorcing his first wife and unlawfully taking his sister-in-law, Herodias, as his second wife. The ruler Herod did not like being publicly criticized by John the Baptist and had him imprisoned. His second wife, Herodias, however, took it more personally and demanded that John the Baptist be executed. But ruler Herod was reluctant due to the spiritual status of John the Baptist. However, on one occasion, Herodias' daughter dances for the ruler Herod, which pleases him and offers anything she asks in return. On advice of her mother, the daughter of Herodias asks for the head of John the Baptist. The king complies with this demand and has John the Baptist beheaded and his holy head presented to her on a plate. Imam Hussein, once admonishing about the lowliness of worldly life, as compared to hereafter, recounts this event as follows. The world in the sight of Allah, God, is so low and debased that the head of John the Baptist was given as a gift to one of the unchaste women from the children of Israel. We will soon see how there is similarity in the life events of Imam Hussein and John the Baptist. Imam Hussein is not only revered by Muslims, but also by people from other faiths like the Christians and the Hindus. In particular, there is a group of Hindus who identify themselves as Husseini Brahmans. They are Hindu by religion, but report that their ancestor took part in the Battle of Karbala and sacrificed themselves in protecting Imam Hussein. They commemorate the Battle of Karbala and take part in various rituals honouring Imam Hussein and feel proud of being associated with him. The Movement of Al Hussein By the time Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, died in 632 AD, Islam had taken firm root in almost the entire Arabian Peninsula and was the dominant political order of this region. However, after his death, there was a dispute amongst his followers about his successor. While the majority of the Muslims sided with the first caliph, Abu Bakr, many followers of Muhammad considered Ali, the father of Al Hussein, to be the rightful successor after Muhammad. These are known as Shias, the followers or party of Ali. 25 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, Ali eventually became the fourth caliph of the Muslims. But Ali's rule was not accepted by the then governor of Syria, known as Al Muawiyah. Al Muawiyah was the son of Abu Sufyan, a pagan leader of Mecca, who was a staunch opponent of Islam and only accepted Islam as a last resort after the fall of Mecca. Ali, though a just and brilliant ruler, could only rule for four and a half years due to his assassination by a deviant group known as Al Khawarij. After the assassination of Ali, there was a peace treaty signed between Al Hassan, the elder son and successor of Ali and Muawiyah, to avoid further bloodshed and political instability in the Islamic world. According to this treaty, Al Hassan will abdicate power to Muawiyah under certain conditions including that Muawiya will not name a successor after him. However, Muawiya did not abide by the treaty and named his son Yazid as his successor, who became the ruler of Muslims after the death of Muawiya. The succession of Yazid started the dynastic rule in Islam, something which is strongly forbidden, giving rise to what is known as the Umayyad dynasty. 
Yazid was an openly lewd young man, with complete disregard for basic moral principles. He killed innocent people, made fun of religion, and questioned its very authenticity. In no way was he suitable to be caliph of Muslims. After coming to power through hereditary succession, he demanded allegiance from everyone to legitimise his rule, including al Hussein, even through the use of force if necessary. However, al Hussein could never legitimise his unjust rule and flatly refused, saying, The one like me can never pay allegiance to the one like him. When al Hussein was asked to pay allegiance to Yazid, he was living in his native city of al Madina. Once forced to pay allegiance to Yazid, he decided to leave the city and move to the nearby city of Mecca, the birthplace of Islam, which also houses the Kaaba. Before leaving Medina, he wrote down his will, in which he describes reasons for starting his movement. I have not risen as a rebel or a deviant from truth nor to create mischief or injustice in the land, but I have risen to reform the nation of my grandfather, Muhammad. I intend to encourage and enjoin goodness and discourage and oppose evil. He then invited others to join his movement and said, I put my trust in God alone, and to him we have to return. At another occasion he said, We are the household of the Prophet Muhammad. We are his successors and inheritors. We are the most suitable to be in his place, but a group of people took away our right. We remained patient on it to avoid division in the community though we knew we are the most deserving of which others are occupying. I am inviting you to the Book of God and the Way of the Prophet, because the Way of Prophet has died, and innovation has taken its place. He further said, Don't you see that the truth is not followed and there is no one to oppose the falsehood? In this situation a believer should wish to meet his Creator. I consider death, while opposing falsehood, as an honor and living under oppression as painful and humiliating. When Imam Hussein started his movement, many people who were sincere to him cautioned and advised him not to oppose the oppressive ruler Yazid, as most likely Yazid would have him killed. On many occasions, Imam Hussein himself clearly expressed that he knew that he would get killed in this endeavor, as well as anyone else who joined him. But he sees this outcome as part of a divine plan from which he sees no way out. He also considers it to still be a better choice than to accept and legitimize Yazid's rule, or to remain silent and indifferent to this oppressive ruler. When Prophet Muhammad's surviving widow and Imam Hussein's grandmother, Umm Salma, cautioned him not to travel towards Iraq, as she had been foretold by Prophet Muhammad that his grandson Hussein would be killed in Iraq, he replied, I am well aware that I will be slaughtered through enmity and oppression, but it is God's will that my household are driven away from home, my children are slaughtered, they are taken captives, they call for help and there is no one to help them. At another occasion he said, Death is written for the children of Adam just as a necklace is commonly seen in a young girl's neck. My place of martyrdom has already been determined, to which I will reach. I can foresee being torn to pieces in a place called Kabbalah, but there is no escape from what that has been ordained. We the household of the Prophet are pleased with what God is pleased with as well. We will show patience and forbearance on God's trial and tribulations. Imam Hussein understood that taking a stand in front of Yazid is the right course of action, and he was willing to pay the ultimate price for it. He could also see how this would prevent complete disintegration of Islam, and his pure blood would give a new life to Islam from which it could never die. Imam Hussein had the spiritual insight to see that this worldly life is short-lived and temporary, with no real value in its material possessions and positions, and that the real life is what is to come after death, where one will be placed according to what one has done in this world. So insignificant were the material possessions in his eyes that once he said, As if the worldly life never existed, and as if the hereafter has always been. The Sacrifice After settling in Mecca, Imam Hussein sent a letter to nearby Iraqi city of Basra, making people aware of his movement. The news of his refusal to accept Yazid as a legitimate ruler spread to other parts of the Islamic world as well. 
In particular, people of the Iraqi city of Kufa started writing letters to him, inviting him to be their leader. In order to better assess the situation in Kufa, Imam Hussein sent his cousin, Muslim bin Akil, as an emissary. Once Muslim reached Kufa, thousands of people paid allegiance to him, vowing to accept Imam Hussein as their leader. Meanwhile, in Mecca, the Hajj season was starting, and thousands of pilgrims from all across the Muslim world were gathering to perform pilgrimage of Hajj. In the guise of pilgrims, Yazid had sent some assassins to kill Imam Hussein. Sensing this, and to preserve the sanctity of the place, Imam Hussein decided to leave Mecca just a day before the Hajj and started moving towards the Iraqi city of Kufa, where thousands had already written letters vowing to support him. Before leaving Mecca, he made it clear to the people travelling with him what is expected of them on this journey. Know that whoever from you is willing to sacrifice the blood of his heart for us and is eager to meet Allah, then he should come along. With Imam Hussein was also travelling his family, including his wives, sons, daughters, brothers and cousins, along with many other companions who wanted to support his movement. Yazid, sensing that he was losing his grip of power in Kufa, changed its governor and appointed a brutal and tyrannical man named Ibn Ziyad. Ibn Ziyad immediately started imprisoning supporters of Imam Hussein, threatening people with dire consequences if they opposed Yazid, and also started to buy loyalties of the influential people in Kufa. With concerted efforts, using both threat of oppression and reward for compliance, he was able to dissuade most people from supporting Imam Hussein's emissary, Muslim bin Akil. Muslim felt betrayed and saw how the people of Kufa, who were once very vocal in supporting him, turning their backs against him to the point where there was no one to even give him shelter in the entire city of Kufa. Eventually, Muslim was cornered by the forces of Ibn Ziyad. Even though he was a single person, he fought bravely against dozens of Ibn Ziyad soldiers, but was eventually trapped and captured. He was summarily executed and his body paraded in the streets to warn others from supporting Imam Hussein. While still at some distance from Kufa, the news of Muslims' death reaches the caravan of Imam Hussein. Many people who were with Imam Hussein up until that time decide to leave him. Imam Hussein, however, continued his journey towards Kufa. While still at some distance from the city, a contingent of Ibn Ziyad's army which was on the task of capturing Imam Hussein, comes face to face with his caravan. This contingent is led by a commander named Hur ibn Yazid Riaihi. This battalion had lost its way and had run out of water supply, and the soldiers and horses in the battalion were literally dying of thirst. Irrespective of the mission of the contingent, Imam Hussein, following his compassionate nature, felt it necessary to provide water to the entire army of Hur including the animals, from his own store of water. Hur afterwards told Imam Hussein that he has been tasked with capturing him and will not let him move forward. At the same time, Hur respected Imam Hussein, being the grandson of the Prophet, and did not want to initiate battle or use force unless absolutely necessary. The two sides agreed to keep moving side by side. In this way, Hur can keep an eye on the movement of Imam Hussein. Eventually, Imam Hussein's caravan reaches an area near Euphrates, where his horse will not move any forward. He changed his horse several times, but none of the horses would move forward. Imam Hussein then asked the locals, what is the name of this land? And he was told that this place is known as Nainawa. He said, is there another name also? He was told this land is also known as Karbala or the place of trial and tribulation. On hearing this, Imam Hussein asked his caravan to disembark and camp at this location, for he foresaw what was coming next. He said, This is the place of our stay. By God, this is the place of our graves. By God, this is the place from which we will be raised on the day of judgment. My grandfather promised about this, and his promise is never false. Once Imam Hussein and his caravan had been cornered in Karbala, 
Additional forces, sent by Ibn Ziyad on the orders of Yazid, started to pour in. They asked Imam Hussein to remove their encampment from the riverside, blocking access to water. In order to avoid bloodshed over water, and not to initiate hostilities from his side, Imam Hussein asked his brother Al Abbas, who was the flag bearer of his camp, to remove tents away from the river. Then, Umar ibn Sa'd, who was the son of a famous companion of Prophet Muhammad, Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas, arrived with several thousand soldiers and took command of the Yazidi army. Another commander by the name Shimra bin Ziljoshan also arrived with nearly 4,000 soldiers. Imam Hussein was now completely surrounded and bloodshed looked inevitable. Ibn Ziyad sent a letter to Imam Hussein stating that he has orders from Caliph Yazid to demand allegiance from Imam Hussein or to kill him. Imam Hussein again refused to pay allegiance to Yazid and replied, Those people never flourish who trade other people's pleasure with God's anger. Imam Hussein advised the commander of Yazid's army, Umar ibn Isad, and warned him from not fighting him. Umar ibn Isad did agree to listen. However, he did not heed Imam's advice. Next day, it appeared Yazid's forces will initiate the battle. But Imam Hussein asked them to delay fighting for a day, as he wanted to spend one more night in prayer and supplication. This was agreed on. That night, Imam gathered all his companions and relatives and told them that he is withdrawing his allegiance from them and they are free to go. The Yazid's forces are only after him and once they get him, they will not bother anyone else. He even extinguished the lamp so no one is embarrassed to leave. However, his loyal family members and companions were not going anywhere. They vowed that even if they are killed a thousand times, they will not leave him. Such was the charisma of Imam Hussein and the loyalty of his companions that they prefer to die with him rather than live a life without him. The next day, which was the 10th day of the month of Muharram, also known as Ashura, the battle was set to begin between a band of 70 to 100 soldiers of Imam Hussein, surrounded by several thousand soldiers of Yazid's army. Imam Hussein had encamped such that there were small hills behind his tents, and his men had dug out a trench on the sides, so the only place Yazid's forces could engage with him was on the front. In this way, he was able to neutralize to a degree the significant numerical superiority of Yazid's forces. In the morning, he addressed his men, made a statement which reflected his connection with the world of divine. He said, On this day, God has given permission for mine and yours death. So, be steadfast in your fight. He further said, Be patient, O honorable men. Death is just a bridge, which takes you from difficulties and trials to a vast heaven with everlasting blessings. Which one of you will not want to move from a prison to a palace. Before the hostilities could begin, Imam Hussein decided to warn Yazid's forces one more time and dissuade them from committing this incredibly colossal and depraved crime. He addressed them and said, God has created this world for extinction. Every new thing here will get old and every blessing will eventually get destroyed. Its happiness will change to sadness. This is a shallow place and a place of temporary stay. Don't get deluded by this world, because whoever trusts it will have his aspirations interrupted and whoever desires it will be unfulfilled. You have gathered on something which will earn you anger of God and Satan has overpowered you. Am I not the grandson of your prophet? Have I killed anyone for which you want to take a revenge? Or have I caused your material loss? One of the soldiers in Yazid's army replied to Imam Hussein and suggests why does he not pay allegiance to Yazid so he would not be harmed? To which Imam Hussein replied, No, by God, I will never give my hand in allegiance like a humiliated person, nor will I run away like a slave. He further said, By God, this person of illegitimate birth, born to a person of illegitimate birth, has forced two choices on me either to accept an unsheathed sword or to face humiliation. And far away, 
is humiliation from us. He made it clear to them that accepting submission to an illegitimate ruler who is bent upon undoing the work of his grandfather Muhammad is just not an option. I prefer honourable death over obedience to debased people. Soon afterwards, the hostilities began. The first arrow was thrown by commander of Yazid's army, Umar ibn Sa'd. He said, Be a witness that I am the first one to throw the arrow. The Yazid's forces followed this with a massive barrage of arrows, which resulted in several casualties amongst Imam Hussein's forces. Imam then encouraged his fighters to engage as well by saying, O oh, honourable men, move towards death, from which there is no escape. Imam Hussein's soldiers were hungry and thirsty for three days, but were fearless and in very high spirits. They exacted massive casualties to Yazid's army as well, but one by one they fell to the ground. At this time, a surprise turn of events happened as one of the commanders in Yazid's army, Hur ibn Yazid Riyai, who had earlier blocked Imam's path, realized his mistake that he is taking part in killing the grandson of his prophet. He decided to defect and sought forgiveness from the Imam, vowing to join him and fight on his behalf. Imam welcomed him and replied, Yes, God accepts your repentance and has forgiven you. Hur fought on the side of the Imam and died defending him. Imam Hussein was very proud of his few but extremely loyal companions. He said that no one has ever had such faithful and loyal companions as he had. After the companions, it was the turn of the family member of the Imam to go and fight. The first one to proceed in the battle was none other than the beloved elder son of Imam, called Ali Akbar. He resembled the Prophet of Islam a lot in his appearance, and the Imam loved him immensely. When he moved towards the enemy, Imam Hussein said the following, O oh God, be a witness that the one who is going towards this people resembles your Prophet the most in his appearance, his manners, and his speech. Whenever we wish to see your Prophet, we will look at him. Ali Akbar attacked the enemy ferociously, saying that, by God, a low man will never rule over us. He fought gallantly and killed scores of them, but eventually was taken down by a spear to his ribs. On his death, Imam said, Dust be on this world after you. One by one, Imam's cousins, his brothers and nephews went to fight and caused heavy losses to the Yazid's army, but eventually were overwhelmed by numerical superiority. The last one to go from Imam's side was his brother and flag-bearer, Al-Abbas. Abbas had a tall stature, an overwhelming presence, and was extremely brave and a skillful fighter. The enemy soldiers dreaded engaging him directly. Imam asked him to go and fetch some water for the children and ladies as they were dying from the thirst. Al-Abbas, though alone, made his way to the riverbank and was able to fill a water jacket. Such was his loyalty to his brother, Al-Hussein that though he had access to water, he decided not to drink any water himself until he had delivered water back to the camp. On his way back, he said, I am not afraid of death, though I hear it scream. Till my body is covered with swords, my life be sacrificed for the son of Mustafa. I am Abbas. I will take this water to the tents, and the fighting in battle does not scare me. As he was galloping back, he was ambushed from behind the trees, and both his arms were severed. He fell to the ground and could not make it to the tents. On the loss of Al-Abbas, the Imam said, Indeed, my back has been broken. The Imam was all alone now. He raised his voice and said, Is there anyone to defend the ladies of the Prophet of Islam? Is there anyone to help us? On his call, the infant son of Imam, Ali Asghar, who was only six months old, fell from his cradle. The infant was dying from thirst. His mother could not produce any more milk due to severe dehydration. The Imam brought this baby out to the battlefield, covering him with a cloth under the scorching sun, and said to Yazid's forces that they may have dispute with him, but surely this infant baby has not wronged anyone. Please give him some water, as he's dying from thirst. 
This moved many soldiers in Yazid's army, who started crying, seeing a helpless father asking for water for his infant son. However, Umar ibn Sa'd, sensing a rebellion, may break out amongst his forces, asked a marksman to take out the baby. A three-pronged arrow was thrown towards the baby's neck, who flapped in as the arrow pierced the small neck and got lodged into his father's arm. Showing incredible patience and forbearance at this, Imam said, This tragedy is also easy for me because God is watching this. In the end, it was only Imam Hussein who was left alone, after all his companions and family members had been killed. He then approached the ladies in his family to bid them farewell. He advised them to adopt patience and get ready for trials. God is your protector, who will soon deliver you from your enemies. He came to the tent of his only surviving son, Ali bin Hussein, who was very ill and could not take part in the fighting. He made him aware of the situation and what is expected to come after his martyrdom. He forbade Ali bin Hussein from taking part in warfare so that the chain of imams can continue after him. He also met with his beloved sister, Zainab, and cautioned her not to lose patience on the trials that are to befall her. He bid farewell to other ladies in the household, including his four-year-old daughter, Sakina. Standing here alone On a land so far from home A place where angels cry While infant children die Hussein has said goodbye Praying some of them survive The torture and the heat They can't bear to watch him leave They cry out Hussein Then, Imam Hussein mounted on the horse and galloped towards the battlefield. He addressed the enemies by saying, Death is better than accepting humiliation, and accepting humiliation is better than going to hellfire. I am Hussein, son of Ali, and I have vowed never to bow down to the enemy. I will defend the family of my father and will be killed in the way of my prophet's religion. Despite being extremely thirsty, tired, injured, and heartbroken, Imam started a ferocious attack on the enemies and drove them back. While fighting, he was shouting, Now see how the old man fights. Now see how the thirsty fights. Now see how he fights who has lost his sons and brothers. He would attack them on the right and the left flanks. Sometimes he will go right into the heart of the enemy forces. The enemy soldiers were afraid to engage him in close combat. Instead, they started throwing arrows and stones at him. His body was soon peppered with arrows, and he was injured from head to toe. He was now surrounded from all sides, extremely thirsty, tired, and alone, without any helpers. Then, one of the arrows pierced his chest, and he could no longer stay on horseback, and fell down. They were still too afraid to approach near him. Finally, the most wretched person of them all, Shimr bin Ziljoshn, walked up to him. He sat on his chest, grabbing his beard with one hand and started to hit the back of his neck with a dagger. The dark wind started to blow and the ground in Karbala started to shake as if an earthquake was coming. He hit his neck several times till he beheaded him. The nation of Muhammad had done the unthinkable. They had killed his only surviving grandson within 50 years of his passing away. The Captives The severed head of Imam Hussein's was raised on a spear. Immediately afterward, the enemies attacked the ladies in the tents and started looting the valuables. They started removing head covers from the ladies and snatching their jewellery. Then they set the tents on fire. 
Ali bin Hussein, the only surviving adult male from Imam Hussein's side, was taken as prisoner and bound in chains. Even after killing Imam Hussein, they were not satisfied. They decided to trample the body of Imam Hussein with the hooves of the horses. The bodies of martyrs were not allowed to be buried. All the heads were removed from the bodies and raised on spears. The ladies were also taken as captives with their hands tied and then marched towards the court of Ibn Ziyad's in Kufa the very next day. The people of Kufa, who were once vowing to take Imam Hussein as their leader, were now ashamed and remorseful for letting this happen due to their personal timidity, weakness and betrayal. Ibn Ziyad taunted Lady Zainab and said, Did you see how God treated your brother and your family? To this Lady Zainab replied, I saw nothing but beauty. This is Karbala Oh, Zainab left her heart She left her brothers in the dust But there's much more pain to come This is the road to shine The surviving household of the Prophet, comprising mostly of women and children, were paraded through different cities of Iraq and Syria, along with the decapitated heads of the martyrs raised on spears. On the way, many people taunted them, made fun of them, and threw stones at them. Finally, they were brought to the court of Yazid in Damascus. For Yazid, it was a moment of rejoicing, as in his mind, he had crushed any opposition to his illegitimate rule. Just like John the Baptist, the severed head of Imam Hussein was presented to Yazid on a tray, who celebrated this as a great victory. He thought he had taken the revenge of his forefathers, who had been killed by Hussein's father Ali in the early days of Islam during the battles between the new Muslims and the pagan ancestors of Yazid in Mecca. However, despite unimaginable suffering and the arduous journey, Imam Hussein's son Ali bin Hussein and his sister Zainab bint Ali were not subdued by the colossal calamity they had just gone through. They gave fiery sermons, reminding the Muslims that they had killed the family of their own prophet and had taken his granddaughters as captives. Through their speeches in the bazaars and the court of Yazid, they made the people realize what injustice Yazid had done and that he still remained an illegitimate ruler. Almost all alone. Body broken scars at deep Skin pale from night's awake This is Zain on Severed head. He cries, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. Lady Zainab said in the court of Yazid, Do you think that by killing the godly person, you have become great and respectable? 
and the Almighty looks at you with special grace and kindness. You have, however, forgotten what Allah says. The disbelievers must not think that our respite is for their good. We only give them time to let them increase their sins. For them, there will be a humiliating torment, she further said. Plan your stratagem, strive to your maximum, and put your best efforts, but by Allah, neither will you be able to erase our memory from people's minds, nor can you destroy our revelation, nor can you reach our heights, and your shame for killing Hussein cannot be washed away. The people, on hearing the truth, were deeply moved, and Yazid started to become unpopular. It was getting harder for him to keep the family of the Prophet captive for long, and he was forced to let them go. Roughly 40 days after the death of Imam Hussein, the freed captives returned to Karbala, a day known as Arbaeen. The bodies since then had been buried in the marked graves. For the rest of their lives, both the sister of Imam Hussein, Lady Zainab, and his son, Ali bin Hussein, the fourth Imam, continued to highlight the sacrifice of Imam Hussein and kept his memory and goals and objective of his movement alive. They laid the foundation of commemorating the tragedy of Karbala. So this great injustice does not get buried in the pages of history with the passage of time. Today, millions of Shia Muslims commemorate the death of Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura across the globe, with gatherings of lamentation and chest beating. During these gatherings, the story of his martyrdom and reasons behind it are narrated. The message of Imam Hussein has been kept alive and, in fact, is growing by the day. The highest point of these gatherings is a day known as Arbaeen, when 15 to 20 million people from all across the globe visit Karbala every year to mark this occasion and renew their allegiance to Imam Hussein. Many of them walk on foot for 80 kilometers between the cities of Najaf and Karbala. Today, the message and the movement of Imam Hussein is not only well preserved and alive, but continues to grow and is spreading across the globe. Al Hussein is for all people and for all times. The legacy of Imam Hussein has left an irrevocable mark on the course of history. He has set such high standards for the humanity that it's almost impossible for anyone to exceed his level of conviction and willingness for sacrifice. All of this stems from his intense love for God, which gave him the conviction and trust in the divine being, such that the enormity of challenge and lack of supporters had no impact on his decisions or actions. So lofty was his determination and resolution that pain of losing every possible relationship and worldly possession and honour was not going to be a deterrent that could stop him in his path. Hussein is the ultimate free man and is rightly called Abu Akhrar, the father of the free men and women. I think that the, the greatest impact of the story is his willingness to embrace the struggle against injustice and tyranny, not to give in to it, and to go through with that commitment, with that dedication, in the face of all odds, in the knowledge of certain death for himself and also for his companions, and yet to persevere in faith, in trust, and in submission to God. Imam Hussein is the successor to all the prophets, including Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them all of them, as he kept the mission of all the prophets of establishing justice alive. But what is in the story of Al-Hussein for ordinary people in their everyday lives, some of which may not even be Muslims? Imam Hussein has been called the lamp of guidance and the ship of salvation. When ordinary people learn about Al-Hussein and what ordeal he went through to stand firm on his principles, it creates two immediate impacts. The foremost is the love and affection for Al-Hussein. No person with a beating heart can learn about the tragedy of Karbala and not be moved by it. This love immediately softens the heart, and the least benefit of it will be that a person with love of Hussein will not be an oppressor. No one can love Al-Hussein and continue to oppress others without remorse at the same time.
This love also has a tremendous power to bring people back towards their humane side. In daily course of life, we all drift into habits and infatuations which can be detrimental for us. However, remembering Al Hussein and his sacrifice kindles a warmth in the heart which can overcome all other attachments. Staying attached to Al Hussein and remembering him often keeps us on the path. But the second and more important impact of remembering Al Hussein is that it makes one fearless. The fear of loss is one of the biggest barriers to higher human achievement. But those who are attached to Al Hussein should find in themselves a courage which enables them to overcome the fear of loss. The follower of Al Hussein can never be timid. But still, the more meaningful impact of having attachment with Al Hussein is the ability to speak what is true, to stand with what is just, and to act with what is righteous, irrespective of what the cost may be. In our everyday life, we all come across situations in which what is being demanded of us is not compatible with our moral standards. There is a sense of subjugation and even self-disrespect in doing something which we don't agree with and don't want to do. Al Hussein gives us the courage to say no. If we're attached to Al Hussein, we'll find in our innermost being an ability to say no to what we don't agree with when there is real prospect of material and personal loss in saying no. And this is the trait of free men and women. Hussein can give all of us that freedom, which helps us overcome our fears of loss, to arrive at decisions which are correct. The follower of Al Hussein also should not run away or hide to avoid the situations, but should have the courage to face them as they are. The lover of Al Hussein, at the very least, cannot be an oppressor, and when this love grows and gets stronger, can transform us into a brave individual. People are able to understand life differently. They're able to understand that their lives are not empty or pointless or meaningless and that injustice doesn't always win. They are able in that space that is called Karbala, they are able to discover that life has purpose and has meaning and that justice is worth fighting for. Karbala, instead of being just a particular event in Islamic history, Karbala becomes an ongoing thing. It becomes a constant curving or bending towards what is right and what is just and what is moral and what is correct. In that sense, for me, Hussein is archetypal. Hussein is one of those people, these archetypal figures or these models that can be imitated, who point us in a new direction, who live their lives so utterly vibrantly and so differently who preach often from a very unpopular edge, but an important message. That these archetypal figures are crucial for us, for a whole of humanity. I would see Hussein as transcending all religious boundaries, all cultural boundaries, even linguistic boundaries. And he becomes, for us, in the times we're living in, a reminder that justice is worth fighting for, that truth is always worth standing for, no matter what the cost. He speaks not just to people involved in great revolutionary moments, people involved in great political movements, but to ordinary people like myself, whose greatest struggle is just to be faithful day by day to the ordinary values of life. Even those moments pr produce and provide for us Karbala moments when we have to take little stands, unpopular stands, stands that people, even people we love, won't agree with for truth and for justice and for morality and for rightness. Those are our Karbala moments for each of us. And Hussein and Zainab too are enormous inspirations. Hussein is an archetype, a model, a universal model for what is right and just. Besides our personal struggles and battles, humans have social responsibilities also. The biggest impact of Al Hussein is that his follower cannot be indifferent to social problems, inequalities and injustices. Every day, Ashura and all the Arzen Karbala are a common language. It is not the fact that every day Karbala is a good day. What kind of Karbala, Karbala, what kind of Karbala, what kind of Karbala, what kind of Karbala, what kind of Karbala, 
مقابله اسلام با کفر مقابله عدل با ظلم مقابله عدد کم با ایمان زیاد در مقابل عدد زیاد با بی ایمانی نه از جمعیت کم به ترسی تو نه از شکست به ترسی تو شکستی تو کار نی وقتی کار برای خدا باشه شکست توش نی. People in our societies, whether living in liberal democracies, autocratic monarchies or military dictatorships, are suffering from exploitation by those in power. The rights of citizens are ignored, whereas rich and powerful get their way. The poor face full force of legal justice system, whereas the rich and powerful have loopholes to give them relief if they're caught committing illegal actions. The wealth is concentrated in a few hands. And the gap between rich and poor keeps getting bigger. The power is confined with the few, and the voice of citizens gets weaker and weaker. In situations where imperialism, capitalism, dictatorships, authoritarianism, control of information, and labeling good as evil and evil as good is suffocating human freedom, it is the responsibility of those inspired by Al Hussein not to remain indifferent to exploitation of human societies. But to raise their voice and support that which is good and upright, and reject vehemently which is bad and false, as Al Hussein, quoting his grandfather Prophet Muhammad, once said, "Whoever sees an oppressive ruler making God's forbidden as permissible, breaking his covenant with God, opposing the way of the Messenger of God, and oppressing the people with injustice, and he does not oppose this ruler with his actions or words." Then it's incumbent on God to make him enter the same place as the rulers, i.e., hellfire. This statement makes it very clear that it's the duty of every citizen to be engaged in social and political affairs, to voice their opinion, and to show their displeasure when injustice is being committed, and not remain aloof. Just because we may not be directly affected by certain situations does not mean we should be indifferent to it if it's negatively impacting others. زنده نگه داشتن آشورا یک مسئله بسیار مهم سیاسی عبادی است اعزاداری کردن برای شهیدی که همه چیز را در راه اسلام داد یک مسئله سیاسی است یک مسئله است که در پیش برد انقلاب اثر به سزا داره آن همین حسین که روایت شد است که پیغمبر فرمود است این معناش معنای است که حسین مال من است و من هم از او زنده میشم از او شده است این همه برکات از شهادت ایشون است با اینکه دشمن میخواست آثار را از بین ببرد ما ملت گریه سیاسی هستیم ما ملتی هستیم که با همین عشقها سیل جرایان میدیم و خورد میکنیم صدهایی را که در مقابل اسلام استاده است و این دستجات عزیز آشوراست که مردم را به حیجان میارد و برای اسلام و برای حفظ مقاصد اسلامی مهیا میکند در این امر سستی نباید کرد مجلس اعضا نه برای این است که گریه کنند برای سید و شهدا و عجر ببرند البته این هم هست و دیگران را عجر اخروی نصیب کنند بلکه مهم اون جنبه سیاسی است که این ما در صدر اسلام نقشش را کشیدند که تا آخر باشد شما گمان نکنید که اگر این مجالس عزا نبود و اگر این دستجات سینزنی و نوحسرائی نبود پونزه خرداد پیش می آمد هیچ قدرتی نمی توانست پونزه خرداد را انطور کند مگر قدرت خون سید شهده 
هیچ قدرتی نمیتواند این ملتی که از همه جوانب به او حجوم شده است و از همه قدرت های بزرگ برای او توته اچیدند این توته ها را خونسا کند الا همین مجالس اعضا سید و شهدا و اصحاب او و اهل بیت او آموختن تکلیف را فداکاری در میدان تبلیغ در خارج میدان آشورا را زنده نگه دارید که با نگه داشتن آشورا کشور شما حسید نکرد دیکی ہم نے حضرت امام حسین کی شہادت سے کیا سیکھا ہم نے سب سے پہلے یہ چیز سیکھی کہ جو لا الہ الا اللہ جو جس کا اللہ جس کو ایمان دے دیتا ہے لا الہ الا اللہ کا مطلب آزادی اور آزادی خوف سے بھی آزادی اپنی میں سے بھی اور وہ آتی ہے عشق اللہ سے اللہ سے عشق کرنے سے اور وہ ہے جب لا الہ الا اللہ جب آپ اپنے ذہن میں دادا پہ دعویٰ کر دیتے ہیں پھر آپ کسی کے سامنے نہیں جھکتے تو جب پتا تھا کہ وہ پوری کی پوری فوج سامنے کھڑی ہے پیچھے نہیں ہٹے جھکے نہیں اور جو ان کی شہادت تھی جس طرح علامہ اقبال کہتے ہیں کہ صدیوں تک مسلمان جب کھڑا ہوتا تھا ظلم کے خلاف غلامی کے خلاف تو وہ لا الہ الا اللہ اور امام حسین حضرت امام حسین کی جو شہادت تھی وہ ہمیشہ یاد رکھتا تھا وہ جو پتا ہوتے ہوئے ایک انسان کو کہ ہم جیت نہیں سکتے یعنی کوئی میری موت ہے میں یہ جو اب کھڑا ہوں اسٹینڈ کے اوپر تو میں زندہ نہیں رہوں گا اس کے باوجود وہ عشق کتنا ہوتا ہے اوپر والے کے ساتھ کہ وہ کہتا ہے کہ میں یہ کوئی نہ سمجھے کہ میں خوف کے بت کی وجہ سے کسی کے سامنے جھک گیا ہوں اور یہ ہوتا ہے کہ جس کی جو انہوں نے بیج بو دیے کہ ہمیشہ مسلمان دنیا میں ظلم کے سامنے جب لوگ کھڑے ہوتے ہیں تو ان کو یاد آتا ہے وہ اس, اس, اس قربانی کا اور یہ بھی یاد ہے رکھیں کہ یزید نے کیسے یہ ظلم ہونے دیا تھا وہ کیوں کامیاب ہوا کیونکہ کوفہ کے لوگ اتنے خوف زدہ تھے اس نے اپنا گورنر ظالم گورنر کو رکھا تھا اس کے ظلم کی وجہ سے وہ اتنے سہمے ہوئے تھے وہ اتنے ڈر گئے تھے یزید کے ظلم سے کہ وہ وہ نکلے نہیں انہوں نے اتنا بڑا ثانیہ اسلام کی تاریخ میں ہونے دیا اور وہ ساری زندگی پشتاتے رہے The key fruit of Hussein's message is for his followers to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil, for in it lies the prosperity of societies and well-being of its citizens. The societies which forego this practice start to decline and decay very quickly, not even sparing otherwise good and upright citizens. al Hussein has inspired many thinkers and political leaders from all spectrums of life. Edward Gibbon English historian and politician wrote, In a distant age and climate, the tragic scene of the death of Hussein will awaken the sympathy of the coldest reader. Thomas Carlyle, a Scottish essayist, historian and philosopher said, The best lesson which we get from the tragedy of Karbala is that Hussein and his companions were rigid believers in God. They illustrated that numerical superiority does not count when it comes to the truth and falsehood. The victory of Hussein despite his minority, marvels me. Mahatma Gandhi, an Indian political and spiritual leader, wrote, I learned from Hussein how to achieve victory while being oppressed. Imam Hussein is the ultimate revolutionary, who has set an unparalleled example of how to love God and his creation, and to sacrifice for the sake of what is true, irrespective of what the cost may be, in order to establish justice, and to free people from ignorance and life of oppression and subjugation. There is no tragedy like Karbala, and there is no free man like Al-Hussein. <laughs>